Tumble Track is having a 10% off their camp countdown sale. Everything you need to get ready for camp uh, and items for camp this summer at your gym. And you can get a free pair of running arms to practice your running if you order anything over $99. So to save 10%, check out the sales tab on their website. That's by visiting Tumble Track. That's T-U-M-B-L-T-R-A-K, Tumble Track, Train Smart. Okay, what else I, I would like a coach's sparkly stiletto bedazzled heel to get caught between the mats, uh, like on the Velcro connecting the mats, and then they try to get an equipment malfunction redo yes. for the gymnast because the coach's equipment, very important coach equipment, sparkly stiletto heels, malfunctioned in the middle of the routine. That is what I would like. Remember, the show is PG-13, so you might hear a naughty word or two. Today, the LSU documentary series, an NCAA lawsuit over volunteer coaches, gymnasts are going to the G7 conference? The G7, as in like the world Illuminati, essentially. And we have a preview of NCAA champions. Good start. Basically, Just because we got- got, we've hit Illuminati <laughs> under the first minute of the podcast. Great. <laughs> will okay preview of NCAA championships will Trinity compete is Grace McCollum really ready we saw a video of her release today by Utah um, we have our opportunities for comedy wish list we have updates from the very sexist European championships welcome to the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy I'm Jessica and I'm here with Spencer from the balance beam situation and as you know Friday this Friday is our live show in Texas featuring fourth at the uh, Olympic trials with the Fierce Five, when they went on to win gold, she was actually in fourth place all around, didn't get to compete. Harvard and Stanford graduate Elizabeth Price, better known as EB, and the first woman to do a man wipe in a floor routine, Taylor Rice. <laughs> and you guys, the most exciting part about this is the walk-up drive through margarita stand the pink building across the street from the theater. Yes, mm. dry- it's a thing. Just got other- my attention. Yes, a walk-up drive through margarita stand. Uh, they're doing a happy hour for us from 6 to 7. So you can uh, get your margarita at a discount and walk across mm-hmm. the street into the theater, bring your margarita with you. They have these adorable little containers for your margaritas to go, because that's all they have is to go, and bring them into the theater and enjoy the show. So I do want to remind you guys And if that- you want to bring one for me... Like, well, feel free. (laughs) We accept margaritas. Um, You accept margaritas. (laughs) If you have a virtual ticket, this is what I remind you guys. You cannot buy a virtual ticket after the show starts. You cannot. So even though you can watch the replay with a virtual ticket for two weeks after the show, you can't buy a virtual ticket after the show starts. So you have to buy your virtual ticket now. You have to buy it before the show starts. Also, a reminder, we have a very, very small business. Like there's three and a half, two and a half of us, basically. So um I like Coop isn't uh, the customer service is not available during the show to help you because we're all working during the show, all hands on deck. So buy your ticket now. Make sure you have everything set and you're ready so that uh, you can watch the show with no problems and don't get caught thinking you could watch the replay, but you can't because you didn't buy a ticket on time. So just do it right now while you're listening. Jimcastic.com live show tab. Um, download the quizzes app. Because if you have a virtual ticket, because we have a special game for you. Quiz is, is the app. Yes. I said a different one behind the scenes, but now we have a final one decided on, which you told me not to do. Mm. All right. Mm. Spencer. Yeah. NCA preview. What's the schedule? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's this week. Everything's happening this week. Leaving tomorrow. Semifinals semifinals are on Thursday. First semifinal is at... 2 p.m. on Thursday, local time in Texas, central time. Uh, That's Florida, LSU, Cal, and Denver. Second semifinal is Thursday night. That's at 8 p.m. central time. Oklahoma, UCLA, Utah, and Kentucky. Friday is the in-between day slash the Gymcastic Live Show day. Gymcastic Live Show day. Saturday, 3 p.m. central, is the final with the top four teams to be determined. Yes. And then immediately afterwards, after the press conference, so probably like an hour 
after the meat ends because they got to do. Yeah, the I would say don't sell the word immediately. Right. Give it'll, us a little bit of le- leeway there. <laughs> right, because it'll be all the shenanigans and the people and the confetti and people roll around in it, and then there's a the press conference, and then we have to. Then we'll do uh, for club members. We'll do a podcast with our immediate reactions. Immediate reactions, not immediate like podcast, but Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about it right away and then do our full recap the next week. Um, So, so I feel like I'm like super like, because I did have my iron infusion for everybody that listened to behind the scenes and it went well, I didn't die and it's kicking in right now. And I feel like I'm going a hundred miles a minute, five minutes ago. I was like, I don't know if I can stay awake for this. Woo. So slow me down okay. if I'm Whoa. going too hard. Because <laughs> I feel great. That is what I'm here for. I feel like that's my main job. So <laughs> that I feel that, job. that'll be, um, you know, just as usual. Whew, so preview, great. we're going to preview NCAA Nationals. So uh, behind the scenes this season, we've had a lot of questions slash conversation about Going to meets, where you're sitting at meets, where you should sit at meets, particularly at nationals, kind of like what's the best section for the the gym nerdiest gym nerd, like the dedicated fan, but not associated with any school who really cares about like making some perfectly valid comments about some form, but doesn't necessarily want to be worried about like sitting behind someone's mom when they're making those perfectly valid comments about someone's form. Um, Is it counterintuitively better to sit, even though you're super into it, to sit farther back, like in the second tier, so you can see everything and move around and not really be in the fray? Um, The school fan slash parent section, is it a little too intensey sports bolly to actually want to sit there intentionally? Or is that just um, passion? What about the judges' table? Can they really not see these errors we're told that they can't see from the judges' table? Or is that all a lie? We've had a lot of conversations about the different places in the arena. So as a preview of Nationals, Jessica and I are going to sit in each section of the arena and take a look at each part of the competition from those different sections in the arena. So starting with the afternoon semifinal, I'm sitting up in the second tier away from all the people, as I am wont to do, so I can observe and make my comments separately in the second semifinal. We have Florida coming in. Florida is the favorite in the afternoon semifinal. They're ranked number two. They have, or they have been ranked number two for most weeks in the season, eight out of 11 weeks this season. Uh, they've been ranked second. They won SECs with a 198.425. They set 198.425. Casual, casual, casual. Oh. This is nothing anymore. That's not news. I know. Call me when you get a 199. Um, this year's Florida team set an all time Florida bars scoring record. Uh, they have the pedigree that they've shown throughout the year. We have LSU and Cal in this semifinal, neck and neck, ranked sixth and seventh to end the season. LSU had the NQS edge. If you go by average score, Cal had the better average this season. They had a meet in Baton Rouge. So it was a home meet for LSU, but it was one of those not technically a home meet, but it's a home meet ones. LSU won by a quarter tenth in kind of controversial as in the scores didn't work and we didn't know what the results were fashion. Then you look at Cal, four of the top five scores in program history this season, top score of all of the regional finals last at the last time we saw the teams, Cal got the highest score of everyone. And then we have Denver in the semifinal Rank number 13 heading into the postseason, advanced from their home regional with that 197.875. This is a Denver team that hit 198 for the first time ever for a Denver team and has made history in a number of respects. So basically the setup for this regional is Florida's the favorite here based on the whole season, but we have questions based on regionals, finishing second to Cal in the regional finals, Trinity's injury. They're not out of the woods. They should advance. We have a fight between LSU and Cal. Intense. Could go either way. Kind of a battle of opposites. I think they have really complementary strengths, meaning like different events that they're really good on and different styles of gymnastics. And then we have Denver, who should really just be happy 
like we'll be really excited that they qualified because they were not the odds on favorite to qualify. They were not expected to qualify. Making nationals is a huge deal this season. They are the underdog in the session, but they have the 198 this season. They have the 197, 875. So that's kind of the quick overview of this semifinal. I'm going to send, s- throw it over to Jessica embedded <laughs> in the fan section to tell us what's going on from that, from that part of the arena. Let me tell you all the stories that everyone's going to be whispering to their friend that they brought to the meet or their, like, Mm -hmm. boyfriend or girlfriend who has never been before. And they're going to be like, listen, this is why you need to love her or this team. This is what I'm going to tell you from here. So, Florida, this is what you're going to be whispering. They have a roster with 10 world championship medals on it. 10. They have an entire roster of Simona Aminar world medals. (laughs) <laughs> that is what they have. And that is how good this team is. It is the superstar bling bling sparkles team. It's like everybody that, you know, Twitter is obsessed with, the, everybody that the socials are obsessed with goes to Florida. Also, the feelings alert, very important, is uh, Riley finding her way at Florida, loving college, finding the success she deserves, um, and then and being so consistent, and then also having a puppy. I mean, what she literally has a puppy in a great <laughs> season at the same time. <laughs> the most important news. <laughs> and then also, like, all-around world champion Morgan Hurd, like, even though she might not be in the lineup, like, she's there, and she's enjoying life outside of gymnastics, which she's never been able to before, so that's the other feelings thing. Um, and it's Riley McCusker, by the way, in case it's the first time you've ever – heard of gymnastics that's who we're talking about when you whisper to your friend you need to tell them that um and so <laughs> like over- if you take a friend who doesn't know who riley mccusker is you have to shame them those are part of the rules of yes. the gymnastics nationals there will be quizzes on all of this at our live shows you can bring them and see if they've gotten up to snuff by the time we start so what's your overall assessment for florida yeah, I think the Florida, the, definitely the Florida fan assessment is like when you have Leanne Wong and Riley McCusker and maybe Trinity, we'll see. Trinity in either presence or in the notion of Trinity just imbuing everyone with greatness. Um, when you have them going back to back, everyone else can kind of just like go home because form was achieved. Like form, check mark, it's done. Enjoy your parting gifts, but we did it. Um, so that's kind of the. Yeah, that's what that's what Florida has going for them, and that's Florida's big argument. And we'll see if it comes through at nationals. So for Cal, what, what's like the overall view you would give to your seat partner? Because you know, the, you'd, the be, fans. Just, you'd be if like you're in the, chatting away to them the whole yeah. time. Spencer can't shut up. Right, I, I, that's true. I can't shut up during meets, and I drive everyone crazy. Um, I feel like the Cal fan section narrative is like this team is at least top three, if not top one on bars and beam. And the only reason they're not the only thing that Twitter ever talks about is because they don't have the ESPN broadcast footprint and their meets are at stupid times, like late on a Friday and everyone's already done watching gymnastics. And so people don't see them enough, but otherwise those rotations would be the only thing that uh, you've ever talked about. And uh, we asked Cal about this specifically, if they feel like basically they're getting shorted because they don't have the exposure, shorted in terms of scores or attention marketing because they don't have the exposure of other schools. And, you know, Liz was very, you know, Liz, she's wise. She's (laughs) she's media trained. She was like, well, I feel like we are getting correctly scored. um, And I just want great exposure for all the teams. There's great teams, including D3 teams. And I was like, oh, way to go. Mentioning D3 too. Like, (laughs) God, can we give her any more points for being so diplomatic? (laughs) Um, So this team, I feel like MJ Frazier, you are, she is like the intersection of crazy ass elite level tumbling that she's still doing big ass tumbling. And then the dance and elegant dance that you've always dreamed of having together meshed into one floor routine where you can be like form, archy back, head thrown, dancey things all together. Um, And the other thing about this team is, you know, they pass around videos to each other of old beam routines to talk about um, the amazing, like, uh, I basically was like, do you force the team to sit down and watch Soviet 1980 videos? And the answer was, well, we do share a lot of old videos. Um, and sometimes <laughs> there's even compulsory. They watch Ooh, compulsory. They beams. watch compulsories. 
That's all you need to know. Basically, they handcrafted their beam out of the souls of ancient artists. This is why they're so good on beam. So when we talk about why everyone should be talking about Cal all the time, like you will understand when you watch them. You'll be like, especially beam, you guys just oh, take deep breaths while they're doing beam, like sniff the air. It's amazing. All right. LSU. We also have LSU in the semifinal. And I think the... Th- the thing about this team, and you know, if you're around the LSU fan section, they are, will not be shy about telling you why LSU is great. They will hype up your team. And if you happen to be like on an airport shuttle with the LSU fans, as I have been before, they will tell you in very positive, but very passionate ways, exactly why LSU should win the national championship. And this year, I feel like this LSU team has been counted out ever since Kaya Johnson got injured, and yet they're still here. Like, they made it to Nationals. They made it to Nationals ahead of Michigan. They're ranked to advance out of the semifinal. They finished the year sixth. Michigan isn't here. They're the number two team in the semifinal. And any time you think they won't make it any farther, or this is where the injuries will catch up to them, and they won't be able to advance another stage, they do. And I think that's been really interesting to watch for LSU this year in that performing from the position of underdog has suited this group and we've seen years in the past where lsu you know the last few years of d when dd was there when they were kind of the second best team consistently and had a good chance but never won the national championship we had last year when they um lost at regionals and didn't make nationals they have been the favorite and not lived up to that a number of times recently. And this is the class that has been like, we have fewer expectations for this year's team than we have in a long time for LSU. And they're really thriving from that underdog position. And they are getting to overperform and have the gratification of proving people wrong in a way that I think has really gone well for them. And also their entire team is hurt and yet they're still like the best vault team in the yes. semifinal. I kind of think they should get the highest vault score in the semifinal. And that I actually think we'll get to like some more of the details, but I think that's going to be very important also in this. Yeah, I agree with you. I feel like the low expectations are actually going to help them. And And low, I mean, relative, like there's still high expectations, but relative to like, you know, we don't have the same expectations for LSU as we do for Florida this year. Yeah. Um, I did watch but you also. Yeah, this is what I want to know about because yeah. Jessica has been texting me that now the LSU documentary is like open free to watch. And Jessica was like on it. <laughs> so I want to know your thoughts. So I haven't finished the whole thing. I think there's uh-huh. two episodes left. Um, I will. So let me get to the parts that everybody wants to know about first. So okay. uh, in general, I would say skip the first two episodes because they're like a student project. I mean, there's like they didn't even do the audio right like there's one whole scene where they're you're trying to hear the coaches talk and there's just someone breathing heavy who's has the mic i mean th- this is why i feel like it's just skip them but i will tell you the important part in the first or second episode uh so you don't have to watch it um because then it gets into <laughs> character development of each athlete and then it gets yeah. much more interesting but for gymnastics uh-huh. fans there's nothing really in the first two but um so do you remember when Kat Ding was on the Georgia team. Kat Ding. I remember who, everything about Kat Ding. Oh, one of the great. <laughs> the I think she's an NCAA champion, right? Four, um, yeah. And yeah. four end bars at the same nationals, right? Yeah. She's amazing. Um, and she was on the Georgia team when Jay Clark was the head coach at Georgia. And she did a very honest interview, um, which then Georgia asked her to make the interviewer take down after she did this interview. So to preface what happened when in those days when an athlete was honest, which, you know, still may happen. Um, But she talked about the level of religion on the team and how um, uncomfortable she was. And she said specifically that, um, quote, it became an issue to the point where ideas were almost being forced onto the less believing. Um, Unsurprisingly, to anyone who's visited the United States or been to an Easter dinner ever, um, there is a group prayer led by the head coach that they show at the team retreat. 
Um, and I do want to say before we talk about this, that Ruby Harold from England, she said she never said anything negative about um, being on the LSU team or her experience there with religion. But she did say that the faith of the girls, quote, was surprising to her when she joined the LSU team. But again, not as a problem. Um, and the thing about that cat ding interview is you can't find it now because the person that did it was not a professional and took it down. So I have potentially a dumb question. But yeah. so if LSU is a state university how are they allowed to have like a team prayer as like a team religion yeah not like how is that how is that allowed not like byu who put out a whole video of just them like telling the camera each person why god is important to them and why they love easter um yeah there was a recent uh supreme court decision about just this and like the supreme court decision all the lawyers are going to start save your emails. I know there's many problems with that Supreme Court decision. We don't have time to get into what? this. What a Supreme uh, Court decision! Shocking. Problems, but essentially they they said, yeah, the team can pray as long as you don't force anyone to do it, and there is no retaliation if they choose not to take part. Um, and if you've you know many gymnasts over the years have complained about this kind of thing on the team, like to the point where there was one team that talked about how they had to stop on Sundays uh, if they were traveling because the head coach had to go to mass. So like everyone had to, you had to go to mass or sit in the van and wait for, you know, it was like Catholic mass, like three hours or whatever the hell it takes. So there are, I, I, you know, um, oh, fact checker says it's one hour, but it depends how orthodox it is. Not this California nonsense. We mean Latin <laughs> math. Um, so anyway, yeah, the teams have had, this has been a problem for teams okay. at some point. But um, I think that, uh, yeah, it's something that happens in the U.S. And it's not, I think it's shocking for people that aren't from here. Um, and some teams would not do that. And they let everybody have their own moment. But um, yeah. It's not surprising on that team, I think, also because, you know, they have Courtney McCool is a assistant coach there. Um, she's very religious as well. So the other thing that I want to talk about um, is, so once you skip those episodes, because they're just like sports ball, you won't learn anything and there's nothing about the gymnast. Then they get into like profiles on the gymnast, which are very interesting. Taking one person and going into their history. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there's, uh, there's, some, um, there's some stuff in there that I think – it just shows that I think this was not made for gymnastics fans. It's made for non, it's like for sports bar, all right, people yeah. that are fans of LSU. And they're like, Oh, so there's one thing about like Jay Clark. They're showing them doing their weightlifting. And Jay Clark is like reassuring the audience, you know, we're not trying to get them to bulk up or anything. And it's like, okay, like that is such a, you know, who thinks that way anymore in, you know, gymnastics and, and in health and how important weightlifting is. But then again, a lot of people still think that way. So that I thought was pretty funny and proved who the audience is for. Um, I think the most telling part of why LSU and Jay Clark's teams, honestly, like I think people think that I don't like LSU and I really like the gymnasts and I really like the gymnastics. Jay Clark, I have questions about as a head coach and it's because they always get to a point and then fail to reach their potential where the team should actually be. And I think the most telling part of this was finally revealed in this documentary where like a thousand times a coach will say one of the co- you know many coaches but especially Jay Clark we don't want to be results oriented we don't want to be results oriented like if you say it constantly then you are results oriented you're in you're in you're making impressing upon something that you should not don't even talk about it just act as if you're not results oriented don't constantly say i don't want to be results oriented but but means everybody knows you are results oriented. So I think that was very revealing. Um, Why is that revealing? Because when really good coaches will create an environment where you know you're not results oriented, where you know it's about we care about you as a person, we want you to do your absolute best, you are valued for the best you can do. When you, it's like, Thou doth protest too much, you know mm-hmm. what I mean. Do, is there a? Can you- My more question was: I love being results oriented. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan of results oriented. 
I know you are. I think the reason that it's so important <laughs> for athletes to not think that way is because when all you think about is the result, well, you can coach like that, right? I mean, look at all the Soviets. They were great. They had terrible abuse of coaching. Watch any of the documentaries from that era. It's horrible. Um, but, you know, for a lot of them, not everybody was like that. But um, I think the reason is when you just focus on the outcome, then you're not focusing on the process that gets you there. And then you always tie your self-esteem to the end result instead of tying your self-esteem to how you did as a person. And then that leads down the whole road of mm -hmm. depression and other horrible mental health, health things. So I like that that's how they're thinking, but I don't, I feel like it was said too much. And maybe they said it three times, but they used it over and over in the documentary, you know, <laughs> like in the benefit of the doubt, because uh, it does seem like they just skipped who was doing like change editors or something halfway through because it's like totally different um, when you get to the third episode. My favorite moments of this were when uh, there's a gymnast who did a release, um, missed her release and just slammed on the ground. She just got up and started. Your favorite moment. So it was the best part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the action uh, concussion sequence. No, um, but she just jumps up on the bar and starts to go again. And Jake Clark comes over and stops her and is like, are you okay? Da -da, and then calls the trainer over to do a concussion check on her and said like her head slammed really hard. So I really appreciated that being featured. And may that be a lesson to all coaches everywhere and parents. Um, also, he, Jay Clark talked about adjusting to an arena and the ceiling height. And I think that's something people don't think about a lot, but it is something that freaks out gymnasts. Me being one of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> every time we went and competed in a place with a high ceiling, I was like, it's terrifying. This beam must be 20 feet higher or low, too low of a season ceiling. I was afraid I was going to hit it. So um, I also love the part that they and I, I think they featured this and you don't know this unless gymnasts are mic'd up or you're reading lips like I do very well um <laughs> they do you I do mm. because then I asked people after did the was the last per thing that your coach said before you did bars I love you and did you say I love you back and then they confirm yes that's what we do before we do a routine and that's what they do like saying I love you before someone goes which is that reinforcing like no matter what happens you're a person that I care about. And I know like it makes me feel very uncomfortable as a person, but when you're on teams like this, you're so close and it's just lovely to have that culture of being so open, being able to openly express your feelings. So I really like that. Um, and I like the individual stories. I thought there was a lot of things that they missed out on. I mean, there's a whole episode about Aaliyah Finnegan and I don't know if I missed it or not, but they don't talk anything about the death of her father, which is huge. Um, there wasn't a whole thing about when the Olivia, maybe I'm getting to it later, but I'm waiting for the whole Olivia getting a bunch of pushback about being sexualized. Um, there's many things. It's just very surface is what I would say. It's very team surface. It's not a deep dive into the psyche and the experience and the personal lives of the gymnasts. And maybe that's what they decided as a team, which is also understandable. They're like, you're not paying me enough to spill my guts on here, so, which I also understand. So. <laughs> Tell me about Denver, because we got on an LSU tangent with this documentary, but we haven't talked yeah. about, like, you haven't even embedded yourself in the Denver fan section yet. Oh, one other thing I want to mention, I love the episode about Shenikova because I've just heard not, nothing but positive things about her for years and years and years and years, and I think you really see that in the documentary, and that came across so well. I mean, everyone is portrayed well, but I think they really, like, captured her sort of, like enjoyment of the sport and how different she is and how like loving she is. And I, I really loved watching that part. Um, okay. So Denver, you guys, mm -hmm. um, so Denver, the tiny private school, that's a mile high. I don't know if you've heard in the air. What? Altitude. Yeah, yes. They have made nationals two of the last four times, which is huge. Um, it's, that's the same as UCLA and Alabama. That's the same record. That's how good they are. But we barely ever see them because they have their own TV station like the Mormons. So like BYU. And I think it's worth paying for because they're amazing. And they're another team that you will love their artistry. You, They are doing things that are different. So, um, But yeah, you need to start thinking of them in that category as the, the UCLA and Alabama. It's like teams that have won. Um, so... The other thing I want to tell about them, the things that you should tell to your seatmate 
that you should whisper mm-hmm. to them about why that you should love Denver is um, Lindsey Brown. Yeah. Like, basically, this is a person who was in, coming back from an Achilles, her second Achilles tear, and was chosen to be on the Simone Biles tour because she could dance, not really tumble very much, but just because she was an amazing person. Like, come on this tour just as you want, like, a positive, wonderful angel human on uh, around us during this tour, and you can dance. Um, she lost her mom unexpectedly. Her mom had suffered her blood clots on and off through her life. And thank you to the Denver uh, pioneer paper for this story. Um, unexpectedly. So uh, the, her mom died right after she won her first NCAA championship. I'm pretty sure that was 2019 on floor. Then her mom passed away. Um, th- then she found out recently that her brothers and her mom had cleaned the gym for most of her career to help pay for her gymnastics because the family couldn't afford it. So they're going to pull her out. And she, they never told her this until she was in college. Um, she then tore her second Achilles, which most people do tear both of them uh, and came back. And here she is again doing her fifth, sixth year. Uh, she's going to have all the degrees, lovely human. Just, she is one of those examples of why you watch sports because it's a microcosm of like, overcoming adversity and being incredible and she also gets big scores so data nerds you will also love her for that <laughs> and her floor routine is a tribute to two denver nca champions that champions which i also love nina mcgee forever speaking of data nerds we're gonna we're gonna descend another level of the arena and sit at the judges table to talk about the semifinal because one of the things i find interesting about the regional final is that Florida was a 10th and a half away from going out in the regional finals. Michigan state was that close to Florida and it w- they didn't count a fall. That was just from counting it out of bounds on floor and putting up a couple of fulls in the vault lineup. That's not a huge error. And so I think the in- thing I'm interested with for scoring the thing that Florida maybe we'll be focusing on is they didn't have major errors. And yet the score was, you know, lower than Cal close to being eliminated. And I think we'll have, was mostly due to the floor and vault lineups. And they had four hits and an out of bounds on floor and ended up three tenths behind Cal's floor lineup. So even with a hit, you know, even without counting it out of bounds, they would have been behind the Cal lineup. So I think you have to look at, I'm interested to see how those floor routines are going to be evaluated because given the current score scape, it's like Kayla DiCello goes on floor, does a great routine, super solid, gets a 9-9-0, which is a great score, but also that's like losing tenths now because that's the expectation we have for floor scores is that like a 9-9 is a loss, I guess. Because it's not a 995. Someone didn't throw out a 10 for it. So I'm very interested to see that for Florida. Um, and I think, you know, Sloan Blakely in general, her performance is going to be very interesting because she had that out of bounds on floor at the regional finals and then went to vault and fell. And they really need hits from her. She has the difficulty. She has the scoring potential. She has that high ceiling. Florida needs her in the, those lineups and they need her hitting. And I think, you know, that's certainly something I'm going to be keeping an eye on for them. Are we going to see Trinity jump off one foot to do her bar routine? Do they need her that bad? I don't think they need her that bad, especially on bars, um, which, you know, always a leg injury. It's like that's what you imagine is the most likely. I don't think unless she is able to do a dismount that she could stick. I don't know if it makes sense for Florida to put her in the lineup, but you know, they'll see how semifinals go. If they advance, you know, that morning of finals, Trinity's going to learn like a new dismount that she can stick on bars and be like, Oh, I'm in the lineup. Cause it's Trinity. And, like, she'll be like giant full double tuck. Uh, yeah, I can learn that this morning. <laughs> like I've been <laughs> doing do that, that since I skipped level five. Yes. <laughs> if you like, missed yeah, it, so she had a ca- calf injury. So that's why we're waiting to see if it, heels or if it's too bad i don't think that florida will or should feel the pressure to push 
Trinity into a lineup if she's not able to, you know, stick a landing and able to feel comfortable hitting it. If she is able to do that, absolutely put her in the lineup. It's Trinity. She can get a 10, but I don't think they'll be that desperate other than that to like push it. If it's, if it's to push it, if it's borderline basically. And I'm sorry, it's a lower leg injury is the official injury that she has officially official. The other thing I alluded to earlier, we have sort of LSU and Cal with differing strengths and kind of differing identities as teams. I'm very interested to see how a judging panel at nationals, which now we're on six judges evaluates their bars and beam compared to each other. Mm -hmm. Oh, whoa. Okay. (laughs) Apparently Jessica agrees with what I said. Because my view of it is that I expect Cal to score better on bars and beam than LSU in the body positions, in the tightness of body positions, in the split positions. I expect Cal to get higher scores when compared to each other in front of the same judging panel. I expect, in general, I would say Cal's biggest deductions tend to be landing control on vaults. If they're, they have more falls than most of the teams, they have more 99 starts than most of the teams at nationals. And if they have bounce backs on those, if they have larger lunges forward on their Yurchenko one and a half, that score can get low. So if it does end up being kind of Florida's going, we think Florida's having a good, a good Florida day and they're advancing and then it's Cal and LSU head to head. I, it's going to need to be a big vault day for LSU and it's going to need to be a Shenikova Brock stick day because with them, they have the potential to stick. They also have the potential to go for that stick and land short and step back. And LSU is not going to be able to afford those short landing days in the semifinals. Like with Chase Brock, it's a pretty Yurchenko one and a half. She has really nice four. It's not the biggest vault. That's why there's sometimes the tendency to land short or, you know, if not sit it down, then take a step back. And I, th- that's what I'll be watching most of all for LSU is those vaults, because if they can get Shenikova and Brock sticking early in the lineup, Haley Bryant, you know, when she sticks, it's a 10, but even when she doesn't, it should most of the time still be a nine, nine, five, unless there's other stuff going on. That's a score that I feel like is more predictable and more reliable. Like, you know, it's, it's Haley Bryant vaulting, you know, it's going to be great, but if they can get scores over nine, nine earlier in that lineup, that's an opportunity to create a pretty big margin that could then, you know, they could use that like use that store of acorns for their hibernation when they go to when they go to <laughs> bars and beams. Like we still acorns. haven't we still have enough food to get through the winter because we stuck on vault so well. And so I think that's going to be a very important aspect of that semifinal. Okay, so that was the that's the first semifinal the day yeah. before our live show. I do want to <laughs> between. Uh, these semifinals, I do want to talk yeah. about the most important part of this competition, which is our in arena opportunity for comedy wish list. Right. It's very important. It's, it's yeah. the most important part because, you know, as Jessica and I both feel like we do not have an emotional investment in a particular res- outcome uh, at these competitions. It would be unprofessional for us to be tied to a specific team winning but we do have an emotional investment in ridiculous things happening that we can laugh about and talk about later like that is absolutely if you're asking do we have a team that we root for absolutely and it's team comedy that is very much how i feel about it so i would like to put in first and foremost a request for Gymnasts getting introduced and then being so scared by the flame spurts that come up next to them when they're introduced that are all hot and loud that they end up hitting it, their teammate behind them in the face. That is what I would like to put in a request for right now. Thank you very much. I would enjoy that tremendously. Okay. Um, mine is uh, I want a judge to – or not a judge, sorry, a coach. So what do you like? I want – a judge to finally give a coach a yellow card for hovering okay. or talking near them or generally being mm. in- intimidated, trying to be intimidating. Um, and then the judge yells at them for getting a yellow yeah. card 
And mm-hmm. so they immediately give them a red card and, it, you know, red card is you're ejected. And we haven't had that happen okay. in years. So the so when that happens, though, it doesn't stop there. I want the gymnast to then try to run and pull their coach back from security. Because obviously mm. security is going to have to escort them out. It won't just right. be yeah, just, yeah, yeah. they just walk out on their own. Um, right. And they or the team all looks at each other, waves goodbye to the coach and is like, Rolls around is like finally, and then and then he gets straight tens after that. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay, what else? I on your I would like a coach's sparkly stiletto bedazzled heel to get caught between the mats, uh, like on the velcro connecting the mats, and then they try to get an equipment malfunction redo yes. for the gymnast because the coaches equipment very important coach equipment sparkly stiletto heels malfunctioned in the middle of the routine that is what i would like i want uh a gymnast to trip over a camera person in some way like trip uh-huh. over there not while they're doing a routine you guys right. please um, we're not rooting for injuries no Just, you no know, injury mild trip. slapping and tripping is all right. <laughs> because the camera person was a place they weren't supposed to be mm-hmm. and then finally a camera person gets ejected for doing the wrong thing like, this is mm-hmm. really my hope. Although I feel like at this point, everybody gets has it together and that's not going to happen. But I would love to see, like, that time that at Auburn, that coach, that the, not coach, the camera person just walked onto the vault runway mm-hmm. while, was it Sophia, was running yeah. to vault. That person should have been beaten and ejected, metaphorically, <laughs> but literally re- ejected from the arena in that moment. So What Jessica wants is for, if there are camera people shooting floor from the corner she would like the gymnasts to escape their corrals to break free and stand in front of any camera that is in the corners forcing the camera to move to a better position to shoot floor (laughs) that is what jessica would like i would like to request a gymnast announces that she's entering the transfer portal (laughs) mid-rotation like the first three three teammates fall on beam and she's like nope Tweet, hit send. I'm, tra- I'm entering the transfer portal. That's it. I'm done with you people. We're out. Selfie video with the beam behind yeah. her. I'm announcing. Oh, my God. I, I love am it. hereby entering the transfer portal right now. <laughs> the other thing I want to happen is that um, the like TV for once enforces their rules for good and insists that no – uh, coaches can be on the podium unless they're actively spotting. So no standing on the uh, freaking podium in the corner, blocking our view the entire time in your heels, just clapping at the gymnasts when they get in the corner. Get off the podium. If they're about to tumble and go out of bounds, like jump up there real quick. You should be wearing shoes that fit that you can jump around in. So just do that. That's what I want. <laughs> I want a score flasher to overrule, to be like, I'm not putting up that score. That 10? No. I have eyes. I'm not putting up that 10. I'm not doing it. Justice. I'm taking a stand, finally. I will not flash that score. Rethink your life, and then maybe I'll flash your score. Okay, before we go to the next semifinal and talk about individuals, too, um, Mm -hmm. I do want to mention a couple of things. We'll be right back after this. I thought I knew my family history really well until I found out that my grandmother was briefly the first, maybe, but for sure the only at the time, female inspector for the Department of Sanitation in West Virginia. She faced a lot of harassment in that job, as you can imagine. This is like the late 60s. And she even fell into a septic tank once. So I was like, how many other stories are like this am I missing? And that's why I got my mom StoryWorth for Mother's Day. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones connect through sharing stories and memories and then preserve them for years to 
to come. Every week, StoryWorth emails your mom a thought-provoking question of your choice from a vast pool of options. Each unique prompt asks questions like, what was your very first job? What's the best advice you ever got? I really enjoyed reading my mom's answers to these questions. I've discovered stories um, that I thought I knew, but then through this learned more. Like, I knew the story about my aunt driving into a convenience store, but I didn't know the details about the fact that it, she was learning to drive on a stick shift back in the day. And basically, she confused the brake and the gas and the clutch, and she accidentally hit the gas and flew into the convenience store. So uh, if you want to find stories like this, um, well, after one year, StoryWorth compiles all those questions and stories, including photos that you can choose to put into a beautiful keepsake book that the whole family can share for generations. So I love having this book around because I plan to share it with my nieces. And I love just having a place I can go to the stories and the pictures all together. So um, give all the moms or anyone who's like a mom in your life a meaningful gift you'll both cherish for years with StoryWorth. Right now, for a limited time, you'll save $10 on your first purchase when you go to storyworth.com slash gymcastic. That's storyworth, S-T-O-R-Y-W-O-R-T-H dot com slash gymcastic to save $10 on your first purchase, storyworth.com slash gymcastic. Club members, you can add behind the scenes to your favorite podcast player. You do not need to go to the website. It's easy to do. Instructions are in the forum or they're in every single post about our behind the scenes or college and cocktails episodes. And remember, get your Casa Margarita. Uh, no, not Casa Rita is what it's called. The pink building across from the live show, having that happy hour just for you guys. You can get your to go drink from six to seven, and then bring it over to the theater with you. Uh, and remember, buy your virtual tickets now, because you cannot watch the replay unless you buy them before the show. Also, Nadia and the Secret Police, the book has finally come out in English. Um, it came out on Friday. And if you haven't ordered it yet, this is a fundamental, but you have to read this to be a gymnastics fan. So you need to buy it. And if you haven't yet, you can go to the bloomsbury.com website, use the code gymcastic until the 6th of May to get it 25% off discount. That's just for gymcastic listeners. So US only bloomsbury.com use the code gymcastic uh, spelled correctly with the capital C. Thank you very much. So <laughs> and we're back. Can we talk about the evening semifinal? Can we move ready? Because we've left the arena, we went to get food to refuel in between the semifinals. And now we're back up in the second tier to talk about what's actually going on in this semifinal. So we've got Oklahoma here. Oklahoma, you've ever heard of it? Oklahoma's been ranked number one every single week of the entire season. Oklahoma's been ranked number one since February 2022 and has not been not ranked number one since then. Their only loss this season was to Michigan. Michigan's out. Uh, they set an Oklahoma program record this year for total program score, an Oklahoma record. Then we have, so, you know, Oklahoma's favored to get out of the semifinal is what I'm saying. Then we have UCLA and Utah both here. This, you guys, this is going to be a lot. They've had three meets in the same session this year where they've competed side by side. Utah is 3-0 and in those three meets. The last two times, a combined margin of two tenths. UCLA did have the higher score in the regional semifinals when they competed at different times in different sessions, but in the same place on the same day. Utah, meanwhile, was the only team to go 198 on both days of regionals. And we have to talk about the potential Grace McCallum return, Jessica, because what's mm -hmm. been happening on the socials? Yeah, so Utah put up a video of her with, you know, she has a little bandage on her knee, um, which means nothing because most teams are held together by hopes and dreams at this point. And uh, yeah, she injured her knee earlier in the season. She landed short, uh, hyperextended on a vault. Uh, she did it a couple times, actually, but then once she really landed and uh, hyperextended badly. So she's been out for a long time. So they posted this video saying she's back. So that could be a game changer. Um for and you know she's very solid a very trustworthy competitor so mm -hmm. it could be a game changer so, we'll see do you feel like so they posted a bars video again 
leg injury, we always assume bars the most realistic yeah. comeback routine. Because landing about, from 20 feet in the air easy, on easy, your easy. injured, it's, it's for gymnasts, it's nothing. It's nothing. Um, <laughs> do you think that, so we talked about Trinity and whether Florida needs her in the lineup. Like, is it worth it for Utah to try to put Grace in the bars lineup at least? Yes. And the cop out is like, depends on how she's landing and how she's feeling, of course. Well, I feel like it depends how podium, how training has been going up to now. Mm -hmm. If she's hit every single routine in practice and she hits it in podium training and is fine. Also, she's not going to not go because her knee hurts now. Like, she needs surgery or whatever I mean, she'll have after the season. That's not how, th- more... her level of being a <laughs> gymnast person will not allow her to let any pain stop her. Right, but I think it's more, this is a Tom Thardin question more than a Grace McCallum question. Of course, she's going to want to go, if at all possible. It's, does, like, a question about how gingerly you might have to land change what's been happening on bars? No, he will put her in. That's what I think. Mark mark it down. Yeah. Um, We have Kentucky. Everything lines up. We have Kentucky in the semifinal. Top four scores in Kentucky team history, all of all of them this season, beat Alabama at regionals in the epic Kentucky Alabama quest. Kentucky was like not that epic. We advanced, um, and top ten team back at nationals, ready to go. Possible spoiler: I think Kentucky would have preferred to go in the other semifinal. I think they would have. That's the the softer one, the more opportunity, but. The question for Kentucky, I think, is they're, they set a program record this year, but that was a program record at 197.875. I think it's going to take a higher score than that to get out of the semifinals. That's the tough part here for Kentucky. Oklahoma is Oklahoma. UCLA and Utah are so close, but as I mentioned, Utah always seems to win. Part B question for you, Jessica, is there something in that, or is that just one of those things? Or is it like... Yeah, you like you saw UCLA and Utah. We're close, but Utah wins. You're close, but Utah wins. That's happening again and again and again. Is there something there that gives us a foresight for the uh, what might happen at nationals, or is it just like, ah, they're so close, it could go either way? Roll a dice. I feel like Roll they're so close, it could. Oh, thank God you fixed that. I was going to be so embarrassed for you for saying dice. I was embarrassed for myself. <laughs> but also, you should you should always roll multiple die <laughs> see what i did there because then you have more chances don't just roll one that's boring um yeah. okay so yeah i feel like it could go any way either way because uh yeah i i really do because ucla is not getting the scores they should be getting on floor every routine should be at 9975 <laughs> with a 10 from one judge because Everyone else should be getting artistry deductions. And you really wait till you guys see it in person. If you haven't seen them in person, it's like they're doing a different sport. I mean, they're just, it's next level, which means everyone else should be getting more deductions when in comparison, which I feel like brings them up. But Utah's also amazing. I feel like we have already taken a journey to the fan section. So let's go ahead and dig in. I'm ready. Also, I wanted to mention earlier when we were talking about the LSU documentary and you asked me, why does it matter if they keep talking about the end result? Yeah. And there's a thing called the Streisand effect, as in Liza, Barbara. As in Liza? Who's her? Who's her? Barbara Streisand? Yes. Yeah. But it's not named oh after Oh my her. God, Jessica. <laughs> How I, did I lose my gay friend of the gays card? Oh, you lost that a long time ago. We shredded that in we 2011. Out, we figured you're out of giraffe this, yeah. this behind the scenes this week. So, I mean, that's important. We mm-hmm. have had some feedback that you're actually an otter. But, um, okay. okay, the Streisand effect, not Barbara, is the way in which attempts to hide, remove, or censor information can lead to the unintended consequence of increasing awareness about that information. So if you're constantly like, we're not going to talk about the end result, we're not going to talk about the end result, we're not going to talk about the end result, all you could think about is the end result. Streisand effect. That is my argument against mentioning the end result. Mm-hmm. All right. Freaking Oklahoma. If yeah. you're sitting, yeah, if you're in the fan section 
all, you're just going to be like you're in the Oklahoma fan section. You're making the O and the U with your hands. Yes. You're standing up a lot, like all these fans do, blocking everyone else's view, but you're in the fan section, so this is why you bring binoculars and just stand up, too, so you can see. Um, So, it's freaking Oklahoma. Like, have you met them? Like, your doubts only make them stronger. Like the Wakanda (laughs) Black Panther suit. Shoot a bullet at them. Their leotards absorb it and give them more energy and power to hit their routines with Great form on their highest toe. So that's what you need to know about Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> they so, did count a beam fall in the regional final and still were a quarter tenth short of the top score of the day. Yeah. That's your I, that's your argument for Oklahoma. Right. Like, yes, shoot all of your doubts at them. It will not matter. Um, if they hit, everyone's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> what you need to know about Oklahoma? <laughs> like just that just uh, it's a fact. I there's no way around it. Um, so I think after regionals, it should be even more apparent that everyone should be afraid, and there's no getting away from them. Um, the amount of like anger beam, um. They will do so much break the beam, Simone. Allie Raisman yelling at Simone 2015 World, yeah. break the beam, Simone. Um, <laughs> that <laughs> they could fund every AAI employee's kids' college tuition. That's how many <laughs> broken beams from their anger beam will be happening. So, yeah, that's what you need Solid. to know. Solid. Yeah, And if you want to make friends with the uh, Oklahoma uh, fan section, just play the section of the episode to them because they'll, <laughs> they'll immediately they'll embrace it. you. That's, it's that's also the, all that's true. The yes. That's the point of this section. Yes. What are they saying in the fan section? It's that. What are they saying in the Utah fan section? This is the generation when Utah added the final piece of the puzzle and became the fully well-rounded weakness free team when you watch Kara Aker and Miley O'Keefe and Jalen Gilstrap go back to back there's nothing more that you need as a gym fan like that's that's it they did it and they have both the difficulty and the execution they have gymnasts with different strengths who are bringing different things to the beam lineup to the floor lineup there's a variation there is a level of interest there. And it's like uh, the last time I was at nationals in the stands um, near the Utah fan section, this is the direct quote after the meme. They do this to, or not direct quote. This is like six years ago. Of course I'm paraphrasing and making it up, but this is basically the sentiment. They do this to us every year. Every year we show up and get screwed on floor and underscored by the judges. And there were maybe some gym nerds, standing with me hearing that that had some you know whispered rebuttals to that that maybe actually this is the score they always should have gotten for these routines they're just getting them for the first time at nationals that might have been the sentiment but i think that we're not gonna hear that from the utah fan section this year yep and i feel like they're the team you know, Beam is my favorite event, so mm-hmm. this is I like to talk about Beam a lot. But um, it their Beam in person is like watching UCLA's floor in person. Like you will be transported. It is a different event when they do it. Uh, like Cal's Beam, it's incredible. Um, UCLA basically, if the judges do their job, they're like. If they're actually reading the code and they're actually going to separate, which we've been talking about from everybody else, especially when it comes to floor, they can score as high as they did, you know, 198-2 at regionals. So it's possible. You know what's going to happen is Oklahoma is going to get, like you said, a 199 and everyone else is going to get their highest scores ever. And Oklahoma is still going to beat everyone (laughs) is basically what's going to (laughs) happen. One would not be surprised. Yeah. But I think that the fan story to tell on that team is how yeah. they went from not making regionals last year to getting but a 198. nationals, yeah. Nationals, sorry. Uh, oh, my God, not making regionals, Jesus. Um, but, yeah, the transformation of the team and also Jordan Childs just as an electric human being who loves to compete, who has been through everything you can go through in elite gymnastics and 
got screwed over so many times and became a person that is so mentally strong that you cannot break her and give her that Jordan contract for her damn shoes already. Sheesh. <laughs> really? Yeah. What are they doing around here? Yeah. I think Kentucky, once again, I think the Kentucky fans are over the moon that they advanced and specifically that they did what Alabama and Auburn couldn't two teams in their conference that typically get a lot more attention, a lot more fanfare, a lot more coverage that Kentucky was the one who actually did it and hit in the moment, had the routines on all four events and converted. I think that's the biggest deal for Kentucky this season. They showed that they merit the, the accolades that they haven't necessarily gotten before. And I think they're going to continue to show that at nationals. And when you look at this semifinal, Kentucky will also be saying, no, 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 don't talk about this Utah UCLA fight because look at this 10, 5 10 0 starts vault lineup. Utah and UCLA are putting up their, oh, your Chanko full here, your Chanko full there, yada, yada, yada. Kentucky's like, we have three handspring pike halves and they're all great. So what is this Utah-UCLA conversation? Kentucky went 197-850 in a regional final that was all about like giving Oklahoma all of the scores compared to UCLA getting a 197-925 for a hit in their regional final at home with everything working in their favor. And Kentucky will say, that's not different. And Kentucky had the harder job, the, the harder road to hoe in their regional final. And they were right there with UCLA. So if you're at the judge's table, Ugh, what are yeah. your duties to make okay. sure <laughs> ranking in the end is the way okay. we want it to be personally, which We've is got a couple, yeah. deductions. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple things going on here. And I think the biggest question I have looking at all of these vaults in this final is what are we doing with the Yurchenko one and a half with a step forward? is one of the big questions I have for both everything at nationals, but particularly this semifinal, because we have seen a lot this season, the Yurchenko one and a half step forward, getting a nine, nine. And that right. the step is one tenth. Can't argue that it's Period. a one tenth step. So my feeling on the matter is you better be the damn Michaela Maroney. If you're going to get a nine, nine on your Chico one and a half with a step forward, because that should almost not entirely be impossible, but should almost be impossible because what was the cause of the step, right? The step doesn't exist in isolation. So it better be like the most perfect vault in the world. And we're seeing a lot of, Oh, you know, we'll just ignore everything else because we're taking the step on the landing. Lots of nine, nine and nine, eight, seven, fives for varying distances and heights of your Chenko one and a halfs. We're going short step nine, nine, long step nine, nine, high, low knees bent. And I think that this semifinal could go very, like it could be defined by whether those Yurchenko one and a halfs, if they're saying, okay, one tenth for step, 05 height, 05 distance, 05 knees, that's a 975. Right. And it's very reasonable for like many very good vaults that we see. Like very reasonable. Like, and not that's not a harsh deduction. That's like college deductions. Like, eh, 05, it was fine. Um, that's like if you're willing to do that. We're going to have a very different competition, but a justifiable least scored competition than we've seen from these teams before. And it could make a big difference. Coming back to the important catchphrase, if it's great, differentiate. <laughs> That's right. Take the deductions. Like for me, if you step backwards or forwards on a Yurchenko full, your score cannot be higher than a 975. Period. You have to take the deduction for being short or being too far um, over, like over rotating. And you have to take mm -hmm. a deduction for the step. So nine, seven, five period. It's only worth a nine, nine, five. Like yeah. these are the rules, right? If we're actually following the rules, which no one is, they're following the invisible yeah. NCA code, <laughs> but how are you going to differentiate if you don't take that? So that's, what's important to yeah. me. 
The other thing I'm very interested to see for the judging of this semifinal is what, how willing the judges are going to be to go to the 10. Because a lot of attention on the tens sometimes we will see i think this is i don't know this this is my reading that we'll see 10 fear like getting a little anxious about like am i gonna get shit for giving a 10 at nationals but not 995 fear so then just everything gets even more bunched at like 99 and 995 but utah and ucla both in different respects need certain panels to be willing to go 10 like Utah really doesn't want that nine 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 five score bunching on beam. They need the judges to be willing to go ten for O'Keefe, maybe Acre, maybe Issa. Like they need that separation because if they're being kept at night, like if they're you know Miley does Miley, if she's being kept at nine nine five, we're also gonna see like a lot of nine nine O's and in the in the interstitial between 99 and 995 like you look at ucla's lineup emily lee has been very solid clean lovely routine in the leadoff spot goes 99 almost every time if she's starting the ucla lineup at 99 and the judges aren't really that willing to go higher than 995 utah doesn't have that advantage on beam that they are really looking for from what is their best event i think the same is true for ucla on floor like we're going to see a lot of 99s on floor I hope we see fewer than I think we are. <sighs> I think we're going to see a lot of nine nines and nine nine two fives on floor, and nine nine. Uh, you know, the judges are going to differentiate, three, seven, and they're going to have a meeting before, and they're going to be like, "We're differentiating it," and especially when people fake and don't get that last quarter around on their jumps and leaps, which mm. is so many routines, or over quarter the first one, and then under quarter the second one. Yes. A one and a quarter you know to a three are. quarter is not the same as, the, you know who you are because literally every gymnast. Um, <laughs> one and a quarter to a three quarter is not the same as a full to a full. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So the most important part before we yeah. get to European championships and some gym internet news about mm-hmm. the gymnast going to the G7. I can't freaking <laughs> believe this. Anyway. Okay. So the individuals, the most important thing. Yeah. So the kind of the story is who's not here and not qualified for the basically the whole Michigan team made it as individuals because <laughs> they should be here. But only Abby High School made it for the all around. Jade didn't qualify. Jade Carey, if you ever heard for of her, all around, um, didn't qualify for the all around. Just Beam, Olympic Sierra champion. Brooks didn't qualify for the all around. SUNY's not here. Auburn was eliminated. Her Louisa kidneys Blanco took her out. Didn't qualify for the all around. We still don't know what's up with Trinity. I think it would be a lot for all around at this point, but we'll see. Here's the real question. Yeah. If she just does bars and you know, yeah. she can do it absolutely perfectly. Uh huh. Just with a, do you still you know, give her the all around title, even though she just does bars. <laughs> yes. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Is she, how much pressure would you feel as a judge, even though you don't mean to, and you know that you have to be objective that she does a perfect bar routine and maybe it's not up to the level of difficulty, but technically it's fine. She just changes to doing a, you know, double back dismount or something, which I don't know why I think she'd probably keep her dismount. Um, how much pressure would you feel just to give her a 10 so that she ties the all time record for 10? No for pressure 10. because you shouldn't yeah. be thinking about that. But also like the difficulty does not matter. if She's starting from a 10. And there's no, like, distribution deduction, which there wouldn't be. It's true, but, you know. But that's, like... We'll you know, you can't that, do that. You're not allowed you to do can't. that. And I feel like that's barely a thing anymore, because every score is, like, a 9 9 5. I know. But if you have... Also, her, and, like, we've talked about Who's Miley rotating on, with her, though? What if Wojciech is rotating, and she whips out her giant Delchev, and then what's her dismount? Like, who did who does a double twisting dub, or full twisting double layout on that team? Or Sierra? Uh, Sierra Brooks on Michigan Brooks. team. She does a full twisting double layout. Yeah, she did not qualify for bars though. Which is Wojcik qualified for bars, which is All correct. Right. So if they wrote, so just saying hypothetically, if they rotated together, which I have to look to see where they rotate. But <laughs> um, what if you give Trinity a ten and then you don't give it to Voy? All I'm saying is, I just feel like <sighs> even though the judges are very objective, we know, and they're doing their absolute best, I feel like there there's going to be that little niggling like oh what a great story this would be be so good for the sport but obviously 
I think they'll be very willing to give Trinity a 10 on bars if it's a, t- if it's a stuck dismount and she does everything else normally. I don't uh, think you have, they'll, they'll feel that um, concerned about that based on precedent. I think there'll, there will be a lot of willingness to give Trinity a 10, but also like, it's not a difficulty. It can't be a difficulty thing because like you're given tens all season long for, you know, giant full double tuck on bars, gainer full on beam. And Michigan is rotating in this uh, Michigan, you know, there are four individuals are rotating and they're in the, the evening session along with Jade and Darian. So not in Trinity's section. Trinity, Florida is going in the afternoon. Right. They're in the Oklahoma bars. <laughs> it's just Oklahoma bars and Miley O'Keefe bars. Semifinal. <laughs> that's where that's they are. A, that's what yeah. it is? You yeah. have it omitted Jordan Child's bars routine and the UCLA's are going to come for you. Yeah, well, I, that's that the thing. I was just, <laughs> right, because Jordan Child okay, but, is overdue for 10s too, but Trinity has the record and that's why I was potential yeah. to have the record. Um, let's talk about record. Jordan Childs because right. she is now, of the gymnasts in the field, the top ranked all around her. She's the only one to have got a 39-9 this season of anyone. Of the top eight all around scores in the, in the all around field at Nationals, she owns four of them. And I think that makes her as much as you can have a favorite in this year's field in the all around at nationals. Cause it's so the margins are so small and it's so dependent on the littlest things. I think it makes her the favorite. She's as likely as anyone to get a 10 on bars and floor. I think the questions for her are going to be, is it a Yurchenko double full landing control day? Cause if she bounces back for nine, nine, that's opening the door and she's dismounting with a double pike on beam. That's always hard. It's hard to score if that's your composition choice because we're going to see tens on beam the way things have been going. We're going to see stuck gator falls for tens. How many uh, double pikes are we going to see at Europeans compared to Jordan Childs at NCAA championships? <laughs> One or two? I don't know. I don't know who, how many people are doing double pikes right now. I know. Italy, we're depending on you. We'll get yeah, to Europe. We'll get to that. All right. <laughs> um, we also have. Among the front runners, Haley Bryant is right up there. She had those three tens and one meet. I think she doesn't have a weak event. There is every opportunity for her to get, you know, nine, nine, five on every event without doing anything that isn't her normal. And I, th- so we see the potential also only slightly related when you see Haley Bryant's amplitude on her front on beam, it should show you that you should be deducting like basically every other one for lack of amplitude, because we see people doing fronts and landing like low squatty. And it's like, Oh, it was secure. No deduction. I'm like, no watch Haley Bryant. And then watch everyone else's. That is what I have to say about that. We also have Leanne Wong. She has the bars and beam. Like she's the most likely to get a pang slam and go 10 on bars and beam. And that can go a long way. You know, like Jordan Childs, it's going to have to be a vault landing control day. Um, it's also going to have to be, you know, she is also another one going for risk on floor with that Dos Santos, her Pike double Arabian. It's a tough one to land. Sometimes she lands short and can kind of lean it into a stag jump in a hilarious and beautiful way that we enjoy tremendously. It doesn't mean it's not a deduction. So I think those are the things to keep an eye on for her. But um, I would say there are so many people who could win this. There are like 11 people who I think could win this, but I would, I would rank those as your all around front runners. And then for event titles, it's like, I always am like, I barely even can try because it's like whoever put the, you know, whoever went last at the best time after the best rotation. It's all like trying to preview individual event titles is a loser's game. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. <laughs> I've been burned too many times. Okay. Should we, I have a tangent that I want to mention for a sec. You're always free to tangent. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention again, because we haven't talked about this um, a lot this season, but, you know, NCAA championships are in Texas. There's a bunch of NCAA championships that are in Texas, which is a state that does not have um, abortion health care available for women. Um, there are many horrible stories of people with wanted pregnancies um, who had 
awful situations happen because of this law. So I want to encourage you guys to remember the gymnasts who have competed pregnant, who might be competing pregnant right now that you don't know about. Like last year, uh, Southern Utah had Stephanie Turvart, who competed, I think she was three or four months pregnant based on her Instagram posts. And when she, um, when she gave birth, uh, just last year. Um, and then Latinina, hello, winning Olympic championships at five months pregnant, or she's six months pregnant. Pregnant. Um, so if you want to support those women, think about donating to places like, um, obviously first run for office, be active in your local government, actually go to and testify when people are talking about these laws and make sure you're registered vote and vote. But think about donating to a place like Pink House um, or uh, Planned Parenthood or a similar organization. Okay, I'm ready. You want to take it? Should we take it to the fan section for yes. the all around? For the all okay. around? Fan section, you're going to tell the story of Jordan Childs, first of all. <laughs> you're going to be telling your grandchildren the story your of Jordan Childs. <laughs> Jordan Childs should have been on the 2017, uh, what was it, Worlds or Yezolo, but her freaking coach uh, got a DUI, so she didn't have a coach. So first of all, her coach got a DUI, and then uh, she didn't have a coach and no one else would coach her. So she didn't get to go on this international tr uh, trip. She has been one of the most talented and amazing juniors forever. Didn't make a world team until she made an Olympic team. That was her first time <laughs> at that level. Went to the Olympics, did an amazing job, became the picture of consistency, finally changed coaches and had great coaches there at the Olympics. Um, and then she came to college after the Olympics, then made made a world team is a fantastic made a floor final. Um, there was a, there's a long story about what happened with her mom. Um, but her mom through some circumstance, which you don't know the full, um, full details of what was convicted of fraud and was uh, sent to prison for a short time, got out early. Um, and through all of this, she has been a consistent, amazing, just becomes a better and better and better and better gymnast. Um, and is so there for the fans, gets the important part of gymnastics, which is the audience and interacting and performing and loves a crowd. Um, doing a double pike dismount, god damn it, you guys. She doesn't <laughs> have to. She no. can basically do the easiest thing she could probably think of, and she does it. Um, so she gets 9 million tenths of bonus on bars because she does all the releases that she doesn't have to. Like she is doing the most, the most, and she doesn't have to do this. And she still has incredible form and gets super high scores. So appreciate her for that. She is doing a double twist in your chinko. Doesn't have to do that. Um, she could just do a single and be like, you're welcome. I met the minimum requirement, 995. <laughs> she does more than she needs on everything. Full twisting double layout on floor. Um, and she still sticks it. She sticks it and just stands there like, you're welcome for me existing. Performs on floor. Does the most. Like, I'd be like, my legs are so tired. I need to sit down. No, she's like up, down, all over the place, dancing away. All around her. That's the case for Jordan mm -hmm. Childs because Jordan Childs. Okay. Uh, the case for Haley Bryant. Yeah. The total rock for the LSU team. Just every time she is doing the absolute best. And she is the point of college gymnastics is Haley Bryant. Um, mm. So I would say like she is doing perfection the way you want it to be seen, especially with her vault. She's also doing more. Like, she doesn't have to do a double front on floor, but she's doing it, and it's beautiful. Um, and her vault is so well done that you understand why other people shouldn't get tens when they don't step. Um, because her vault is the most amplitude, the straightest legs, the most dynamic. I'm sure Haley Bryant would go out of the frame if they shot her vault the way they do um, at other competitions because it's so freaking high. So how about for you? I think we talk about college gymnastics being the last bastion of form being rewarded in gymnastics. Well, like Leanne Wong. <laughs> that's, my, that's the end of my argument. Leanne Wong. Yeah. Counterpoint, Jordan Bowers. 
Jordan Bowers. Say, counterpoint Jordan Bowers, who is in the second semifinal. Leanne Wong's in the first semifinal. Do not ever count out an Oklahoma gymnast ever. <laughs> Ever, ever, ever. And especially Jordan Bowers, who can do everything, is so incredibly consistent. And her double pike is Dee Dee Foster level height. Google Dee Dee Foster floor, Alabama. You're welcome. Okay, so I do have one more question for you about the all around, which is we're going to do pick your fighter spoiler edition. Okay. I need you to pick your fighter. Like, who is not not the favorite, not the people we've talked about so far. But who are you? Who's your who's your spoiler? Okay, I'm bouncing back and forth. Like I'm ready yeah. to play Street Fighter. Okay. Yeah. So I am going for <sighs> spoiler edition. <sighs> yeah, it's tough. The- I know. If you're not watching, Jessica has put a pen <laughs> over her eyes because this is so hard. Raina Worley and Elia Finnegan tie for all around. Okay. You know, it's going to be 117 right. ties, so that's totally realistic. <laughs> yeah, You're not going to pick one all around winner. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to like tell us why or no? Yeah, Aaliyah it's Finnegan. Self explanatory. Form <laughs> was essentially born at Gage, so her form is absolutely perfect. Um, it's crazy hearing her talk about how she's known McCool since she was five years old. Um, so she learned it literally at the knee of the master. Courtney McCool, how to <laughs> straighten her legs and point her toes. And Raina Worley, I feel like she is good at everything, has no weakness, and does not get the... She isn't like a... You, people aren't talking about her all the time, but she's just as mm-hmm. good as everyone else. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's my pick. Now you go. My pick is going to be Abby High School mm. as an individual for Michigan, because I think she's going to show up with murder in the eyes about Michigan being eliminated and she's going to stick every single landing. And, you know, she, her bars routine leads off for Michigan gets a nine, nine, five every week. She's going to be last in the rotation where she's rotating. And I think she's going to get a 10 on bars. And I think she's going to stick her your chink one and a half. And I think it's Abby high school spoiler all around. What about, are you leaving out? <sighs> I mean, I'm leaving out a lot of people there. Are, like I said, there are a lot of people who could win. This is I'm because I'm like MJ Fraser, Miley O'Keefe, and her yeah. freaking bars. Miley, and her team. But she has the Yurchenko full. Yeah. Going early in Utah's lineup is the thing for Miley. But like other than that, she's right there. But what MJ about MJ her- right there has to stay, but she's gonna have to land that your uh, Yurchenko double full under control. That's true. All right. So from the judges table, who wins? Lizzie all Brown else? got 39-8, by the way, at regionals. <laughs> well, okay, my question. <laughs> all right. So Here's what I think, because someone we have not talked about at all, who is right in there, two people, Kayla DiCello and Selena Harris. I don't put them in the spoiler category. I put them in the favorite category, but we haven't talked about them yet because I'm waiting to ask you a question. This is also true for Jordan Bowers. Is it going to end up, even though it shouldn't, hurting them that they don't anchor any lineups or aren't right now, haven't been anchoring? No. I don't think it it should. I mean, it shouldn't. Yeah, but I don't think it will because they have all scored really well despite being wherever they are in the lineup. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think it's going to hurt them. And like Selena Harris and MJ are kind of two that I'm like, I don't I think people are sort of sleeping on how amazing they are and how good they are everywhere. Um, DiCello is incredible and she hits, but she has form problems that. I think are going to catch up to her here when they're trying to differentiate everywhere. So that's why I don't put her in this category. I do put DiCello in this category. And I think she's a, like has a really convincing argument to win. If it's a day where, you know, like if it's a day where people are making mistakes or if it's kind of a, uh, there are other things. Like I think if Jordan Childs does Jordan Childs, she's going to score higher than yeah. Kayla DiCello. But if it's she's the one who's just going to be like ride ride it on through ride the wave nine nine five nine 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 five and just be like oh look I won the all around and you weren't even really watching my scores because I'm not anchoring the lineups so I would I would put her up there among like I would put Child's first favorite Haley Bryant second favorite but I would put DeCello up there with like Leanne Wong in the next category and maybe Selena Harris the way she performed in that regional final. Yep. 
Yeah. She sticks that vault again like she did, the one and a half. Uh, Jordan Bowers, though, is kind of like, oh, I just love Jordan Bowers. Oh, I wish she'd bring back that handspring front on theme like she had when she was elite. Oh, I loved it so much. Oh, okay. Um, is it uh, freshmen? I know freshmen have won before, obviously, all around. Mm-hmm. Would you, I don't think it's. I would have to go back freshmen. and look. Yeah, how many have won? I don't think it's really that big of a deal when freshmen win because it's like, yeah, you're fresh off of elite. Beh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it wouldn't be like a shock, like, oh, someone is untested as Kayla Ticello. Like, she's Kayla Ticello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel that way. So, it, we will also have a national championship. We're, diff, we've kind of previewed the teams. I think it's very difficult to preview the national championship before we know who the teams are or how they compete in the semifinals. But I do have one question for you about it before we move on. So... It's been a thing lately that teams are winning while starting on floor. Oklahoma last year, Michigan did, the year UCLA won. Like most recent years, the winning team has started on floor. Is that just, do you think that's just coincidence or is there something in that? That it's an ad, actually an advantageous situation. I think it is actually advantageous because all the adrenaline helps on floor where it hurts on other events. It can hurt on other events where on floor it might hurt just a little on landings, but it really helps to get it all out. So I always think it's a disadvantage to finish on floor. Cause of, cause you're tired. Cause I'm always tired. <laughs> <laughs> But they have like VO2 maxes of 60. So I don't think that it affects them. But it is the end of the season and everything is going to hurt more. And maybe your injections have worn off by now, by then. So, you know, who knows? Can you feel your feet by the time you get to (laughs) (laughs) to floor? Yeah. Um, I think it's probably coincidence. But if there's anything in it, it's that it is lately easier to get the big scores on beam than on some other events. Like, I think it's way harder to get the big score on vault because it's so dependent on sticking. Lots of people are doing beam dismounts that they can stick pretty comfortably and consistently, even now with the beam dismount changes. And so I feel like if, you know, when we get to the end of the meet and things are close and it's exciting, like we've seen time and again, the team will get like a 49 seven on beam and I'll look you on the championship and Reagan can get a 10 or Peng can get a 10. And I think that's, more doable on beam than on some of the other events. And so that could be part of it. Yeah. But also looking at that, it has been pretty common that like the teams that win it's, they're not winning with like the best meet. It's kind of a cliche that like, Oh, you have to bring your best gymnastics to win the national championship. Like last year, we memory hold that Oklahoma had a bad floor rotation in the Mm -hmm. first rotation and then had to come back from that or like that ucla 2018 win it was not a good vault and they were out of it like kyla got a 9-8 on vault a 9-8 oh kyla rude rude that's that's what was happening and so it's like a lot of teams have come back from slow starts to win a national championship also so it's like just i mean the kind of thing where it doesn't necessarily take your the very best meet to win. Usually the winner right. does not putting up their best meet. They're having great moments and great rotations. And part of that is I think, you know, we looked look at Florida and OU. They by all intents and purposes shouldn't have qualified to even get here cuz their regionals had so many problems, but they're that good and they have that much depth as the other team. But normally, yeah, you can make mistakes because one team or two usually freaks out and doesn't have a good which we saw happen at regionals. Um, mm-hmm. But it doesn't take that much. That's the thing. Your freak out can be everybody took a step. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't even have to be three falls, you know? So your freak out is you stuck and then kind of leaned and kept leaning and teetered over. <laughs> All right. European championships are happening and we don't have time because it's NCAA week to get into everything, but we do have some updates for you um, and some Gymtronet news. So if you guys want to watch, Ollie is commentating 
So you have one of the best commentators on the planet who knows the backstory of every gymnast and can say everyone's name correctly, which is a feat in and of itself. So Tuesday and Wednesday is team. It's on gymtv.online. <laughs> Literally the word. I'm not saying it's online. It's gymtv.online. Yeah. Um, Friday, Thursday and Friday is all around Saturday and Sunday are the event finals. And the finals are on Eurovision Sports TV, which I always put in as Eurovision contest accidentally. But it's Eurovision Sports TV. Dot TV, and that's with Ollie. Also, you'll know you're watching the right meet because there are giant portraits of overlords hanging above the competition, Soviet Moscow news style. So that's how you'll know. Did you see the pictures on the wall? I mean, I've seen the World Cups for in Turkey before. Yes, it's it's. I haven't giving... seen this year's arena. It's giving communism and tanks is what it's giving mm. hardcore. Um, but the the place that the athletes are staying in the town looks absolutely beautiful. Untou it looks like it's untouched by the earthquakes. It's amazing they're even hosting this, but it looks like like not it's not Doha, it's not Qatar. Like come on, but a very nice hotel and by the beach that they're all staying in. So that's really nice. So this is an all around year because the European championships alternates a team year and an all around year. But now they do have to also have team standings for the purposes of world's qualification, because this determines, you know, what teams are qualifying. So the Tuesday and Wednesday with the team competitions, which are technically qualification are also like kind of important finals. Um, Jessica gets to rage because of the very inexplicable sexism in the rosters of this event where, the countries that are sending men's teams, full men's teams, also get to send an individual gymnast who can compete on half the apparatuses in addition to the teams. But the women's countries that are sending full teams do not get to send an extra individual apparatus specialist gymnast. So the, the men are sending, they get to send seven and the women only five. Is that right? Six. Well, six, because it's five men, five six. member teams. Five, they so, get five member teams and then a sixth person, and the women get the five member team. Yeah. So, they, I mean, I think this is this is not the first time that something like this has happened. That the that this is allowed to happen. That the FIG allow this because it's an FIG sanctioned meet. Um, and I think it's so shocking for us as Americans too, because since I was born, there's been a law. That that regulates and makes sure women have the same opportunity as men. And here they're like, "Oh, men, go ahead and have more opportunity. Take a whole extra person. Give a man more opportunity than women do." And it's horrible. And I just do not think this should be allowed. And this is another reason why men should only have four events and not six. They shouldn't have more opportunity to win more stuff than women do, even though. And it sucks for them. And who wants to do palm horse except Reese? <laughs> <laughs> and Netarashik are the only ones that should do it. <laughs> it should be its own thing that's done at the parkour event. Um, yeah. Sexism. Um, in other news, uh, there was a day this past week that was just like the European men's injury apocalypse day. Like every yeah. single, like every hour, there was another announcement. Like Max Whitlock is injured and out. Nicola Bartolini is injured and out. So why would you even watch? <laughs> Bartolini <laughs> like of Neck Hook, Tattoo, um, world champion on floor is out. And this is their, this is the qualifying meet. This is the Olympic qualifier um, for a lot of these world's, teams. World's qualifier. World's qualifier. So the, then is the Olympic qualifier. Yeah. Um. So, you know, we won't give the European championships as much attention as we have in the past. Cause there's like a lot going on, but just to keep, be aware, Italian women, the D'Amato's are there. Georgia Vila's there. The British women, um, Jessica Gatarova. There's a one of two Gatarova is there. Jessica Gatarova is there. Kinsella, a champong. Becky Downey is on the team. Georgia May Fenton is also on the team. So great Britain is bringing a very strong group. Sana is back Sana's on the Dutch back. team. That's going to be very exciting. In speaking of returns, Vasiliki Malusi, our <gasps> favorite Greek beamer. She looks the same. <laughs> she looks the same. She's had two kids. And is she almost 40 now? Oh, gymnastics, you guys. You can do it forever. Just And this is a lesson for everybody that's doing adult gymnastics. It is not normal to have pelvic floor problems and leaking 
when you, after you have kids or any time. So don't let any doctor tell you, oh, we've had kids, ha ha, now you can't do gymnastics anymore because you're going to leak. No, go see a pelvic floor therapist or get in touch with Gina Paulus, home exercise coach, a friend of the show who runs adult gymnastics and had the original gymnastics camp because you do not have to live with this. Let Vasiliki Malusi, mother of two and Chuso, be your lessons. So if you had pelvic floor on your Jessica Bingo, <laughs> you are the winner this week. Because <laughs> we got pelvic, we got altitude and pelvic floor. I think we're going to have a lot, know. a lot of bingo, a lot of bingo winners this week. <laughs> um, also, Jessica, I want to talk about so on the Romanian team, which first of all, Romania is sending a full team, not like at Worlds last year. <gasps> um, Sabrina Voinea, who not only is doing a layout full on beam, is the daughter of Camelia Voinea. Romanian 1988 Olympic team, one of the most iconically 80s floor routines in the pantheon of 80s floor routines, which we have many commissions, I think multiple commissioned episodes where we've talked about this floor routine. I'm very excited to see Sabrina Voinea, who is now a senior, competing at European Championships. This is the, I'm a I think we called it. I think we called it like the um, snake goddess body roll floor yes. floor epic extravaganza. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, it's an extremely important floor routine in the canon. If you are not familiar with it. It's it probably is. already been passed around the Cal Instagram shares. Yeah. yeah it's extremely important. That's how important routine. it is. Also Penev alert, Jessica, both Penevs are on the Bulgarian men's team. Yes. The Penevs are back. Eddie Penev competed for Bulgaria, then he came back to the United States, and he was doing amazing and looked like he'd make the Olympic team. And then he tore, was it his ACL that he tore? Um, Had an injury, came back, and then end of the Olympic Training Center for now. And everybody moved to Florida, and he was like, I think I'll go back to Bulgaria. So should be crazy skills from uh, Eddie especially. Uh, I'm really excited to see them. And, you know, we are not there this year because it's the same week as NCA. So we're not doing video coverage from there. But uh, European championships on Instagram, especially in their Twitter, are um, are putting up lots of videos from podium training. So check them out. Um, oh, yeah. Eddie Penn have had three uh, ACL tears in eight years. So he has like he's going to do all the skills. There's no reason to stop. He's he's uh, he's he's had he's done it all already. Okay. Have you, Jim Turnett News, have you ever heard of gymnasts going to the G7 conference? G7. I didn't know that was one of the choices, and I would like you to explain to me in what capacity they are going. They're, okay, well, first of all, the group of seven is like, it's like Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, US, United Kingdom, EU-ish, comp- don't, I don't know. It's a general, like, northern, western group of Big money is essentially what they do. And they get together and, you know, plan what's going to happen with the world. And they, like, I tried to find an instance of Olympians going to this meeting before and I could not. So if anybody knows of this happening before, just athletes, Olympians in general. But um, Wantanabe said, oh, yeah, the gymnasts are going to go and talk about the importance of sports in having peace because we never want another uh, Nagasaki or Hiroshima to ever happen again. And I was like, well, this is very interesting considering the IOC stance on Russia and Belarus and trying to find a way for them to compete in the Olympics and like we have to be apolitical. Um, So it's 10 former and current gymnasts. So, um, and it's being held at Hiroshima. So that is also the connection. So Sharpay from France, um, Regine Moran from Great Britain, Mar- Marcel Wynn from Germany, um, Alexandra Agurileski from Italy. I that was close. I'm shocked you even tried. Thank you, Mai Murakami, obviously, Kohei, obviously from Japan, Nastia Emma Spencer from Canada, um, Pagan from um, Slovenia. I know I, I'm flattered, but it's Emma Spence, not Emma Spence. Spencer. Oh my God, it <laughs> says Spencer in the, and I was like, wait, I just said well, why that, did and you that's, that. I why know her you name not is know Emma, Spence. Who Emma Spence. Is. How dare you? Because you know I can barely read, but when it's in front of me, I'll just read what it says. Pagan um, from Slovenia is on the athlete council. Um, 
Yeah. And uh, Watanabe also said, considering the state of the world, too, it is a duty of the sporting world to raise voices, hoping for world peace. Like, Watanabe, you guys, get shit done. Let me tell you, he's the FIG president, in case you're unaware of who that guy is. This is his second term. He got, an, you know, he got a world championships done during a pandemic when Japan was a closed country. And now he has gymnasts at the G7. This dude is going to be the president of something like he I'm like, just this is so shocking to me. I don't know what else I can compare it to. It's not like being a UN envoy or, you know, the president's fitness council, which is what they used to throw out to Olympians. Um, it's it's just the G7 conference is huge. Um the European Championships canceled extra events. So they were going to have um, extra things planned um, at the artistic Euros that we just talked about that are happening in Turkey, including a performance by a mascot. But it has been abandoned out of respect for the victims of the earthquake in February, um, which is in Syria and um and in Turkey, which is now the death toll. Since we talked about this last, it's even higher. It's 50,000 people. So, but they've announced that they're, um, the entry to the event, like I talked about before, is going to be free. So if you're in or around Turkey, um, you can go watch Euros for free and you can see the overlords in person that I mentioned before. Uh, we talked about Iowa State getting a new coach and Pitt before. So that's the yeah, news. We since- talked about that on behind the scenes. Since regionals, they're out of there looking for new coaches. Um, Let me see. So I want to talk about this volunteer issue. So we have talked for years about how the NCAA has, uh, they allow volunteers, but we all know there's like a kickback system for the volunteer coaches. So it may be that, um, you know, and some of this came out around when there was a turnover at Nebraska and it came out that the gymnast allege, um, this is what they said, that they were um, expected to pay for their own floor routines. So the volunteer, they had a volunteer choreographer, but the gymnasts had to work the camps to pay for the choreographer. Do you remember this? Which you can't make gymnasts pay for coaching. Like that has to be part of what they, in a division one program, you can't do that. Um, And there's other, there's been other things like the volunteer coach will then run like a lot of, uh, colleges have a separate club system that they run. So that's the way that they get paid. Um, But, or like if you, if you're a choreographer or volunteer coach, then you can run our camps in the summer and then that's how you make your money. So now um, the NCA is facing a volunteer coach wage fixing claim in this antitrust suit. Let me just tell you, first of all, Baseball is exempt from this because baseball has their own lawsuit happen because, of mm-hmm. course, baseball mm-hmm. does. If baseball invented every sports scandal there's ever been. Baseball's mm-hmm. like, oh, we already did it. <laughs> like, we know. <laughs> so the allegations are that nonprofit sports organizations are engaging in conspiracy with member schools to avoid paying volunteer coaches. So this is from Bloomberg Law, by the way. So... um essentially they're saying that, and this is why, this is my favorite quote from this. These agreements among defendants and its member schools in antitrust terms make the member schools a buyer's side, ready for it? Cartel. Oh, it's almost like there's a whole book called Cartel about the NCAA, and it has been a called a cartel and compared to a cartel for many, 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 many years. So, um, you know, and it talks about how volunteer coaches often, often spend more than 40 hours a week on the job. So I am, everyone is expecting that volunteer coaches now have to be paid. Like, this is well, it hasn't the, happening. Like, as they of did decide, July, right? Yeah, as of the no. summer. They've, yeah, they have to be paid. I think they say they're like transforming the positions into, you know, casually and for no reason, just out of the goodness of their hearts, they're transforming the positions into paid positions. They just decided because maybe there's a antitrust lawsuit, which, yeah. Also, did you see that Trinity has a partnership with Quattro Leotards? So she's coming out with a Leo line this summer, which I think will be very, very, very popular because Trinity... Like, mm. I want a Trinity leotard, and, like, where am I going to wear it? Around the house? <laughs> I've been 
I haven't got to, to my adult gymnastics class in so long. But maybe if I have your Trinity leotard, I'll go. Uh, all right. Um, do you have anything else that you want to remind people of this week, Spencer? Um, I think we've talked quite a bit about the gymnastics that's happening this week, and I'm spent. Uh, remember that the live show is this Friday. So get your ticket, especially your virtual ticket, if you're not going to be there in person, because there's no cash when you get there. So buy your tickets. And remember to get your your Casa Rita, little margarita in the pink house at a discount across the street and then bring it in to the theater with you. Um, and we are going to have our immediate reactions to the NCAA final on Saturday after the meet ends. It'll probably be like an hour, hour and a half after the meet ends. So, you, But you can log on early to that um, if you're a Club Gym Nerd member and you can chat with everybody and uh, ask your questions um, and we'll have full analysis after next week. So I can't wait to see you guys all at the live show. It's such a good time. I can't wait to watch the contest. Casey is back doing the contest. It's going to be fantastic. So until Friday at the live show or Saturday at the uh, at our recap, please remember especially to take off and gay, split on rights, and we'll see you at the live show on Friday. Thanks for listening. This show is created, executive produced, produced, edited, audio engineered, and published by me, Jess Coburn. Managing editor in charge of show notes, podcast content, and wrangling over enthusiasm is Spencer Barnes. Our news editor is Uncle Tim of gymnastics-history.com. And customer service IT, Gymternet News, and additional production services are provided by Steve Cooper, aka Fact Check.